What's going on everybody? So in this video, we are gonna be covering what's going on in the NFT markets, some major updates on some of the most OG projects in the space. And we're also gonna be doing a deep dive into how major organizations and individuals can actually move markets. All right, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cover, you know, generally what's going on with the market sentiment as we usually do. Right now, when we're looking at the fear and greed index, which is kind of tracking Bitcoin and tracking all these different sources, the fear and greed right now is 18. You know, last month it was eight where everything was like going down. Ethereum was at like 800, $900. And it seems like there's a little bit more confidence in the market. But when we're looking at the price of Ethereum, it's been trading sideways. It seems like, you know, there has been little punts to 1.2, but it seems like a little bit of a trap for a lot of people. They think like, oh, crypto's going back up. But in reality, you know, based on me having conversations with people who are smarter than me, the economy worldwide does not look too good. And actually there's a lot of risk in terms of buying Ethereum at the moment. So if you buy, make sure you can hold for a long, 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 long time. Otherwise uh, you might have to like catch a dip or something like that. Again, nobody really knows. Uh, watch your entry and exit strategy there. And when we are looking at NFTs markets, yes, you know, there's a lot of volume for some of the blue chip projects, which crypto coins had 500% or almost 600% in the last seven days. Board Ape blowing up, Art Blocks blowing up, other side kind of blowing up a little bit. In some ways it's good, in some ways it's bad, where at least they're getting volume, but at the same time, it's not really healthy for the space where it's only the top four or five projects that get all the volume because it really drains out all the smaller projects and it's harder to compete, right? You know, we're going to see this during a bear where people are going to hold the assets that they believe are more safer relative to other things. And then during a bull, you know, that's when everybody goes crazy with buying like these riskier assets. And hopefully, you know, those things go up a lot more than a blue chip would. But again, you know, for the most part, my understanding is for a lot of people in the space, especially people who have money, they would prefer to buy things that can potentially increase in value, have some cultural significance, have a lot of VC money behind them and very popular. So that would be like CryptoPunks, ArtBlocks, you know, Bored Ape. Those would be like the top ones at the moment, right? But again, there are also other different pockets you can go into to make money like Zuki. Clonex, and if you want to like dive a little deeper into those ecosystems, but you really have to understand what you're getting into and how it works. Otherwise, you're just gambling. Well, you know, NFTs itself is a gamble, so you know, we're always gambling, right? Now, let's go ahead and talk about some smaller projects, show some love, right? So, the Littles actually had some recent news where they have officially moved into production with the Emmy award winning studio Nirvana and Time. It's not like new news that the Littles are going into like IP and production. They actually did announce that a while ago. But I think the update now is like they're actually moving into production and they're actually going to start creating this series. Now, what the series will actually look like, we don't really know if the series actually pulls a lot of weight and brings a lot of attention to the Littles. Could that be an IP that increases the value of their NFT? Possibly, possibly, or possibly not, right? My goal here is not to pump anyone's bag or to say what's good and it's bad. It's just to share my personal opinion, right? If it's hit series, actually does become extremely popular and people want to buy like plushy toys and you know there's a lot of avenues for ip then yeah you know i can see it potentially increasing the value of the genesis nft which is the littles and you know there's definitely that route but the other other side it's like who exactly is this ip made for because this studio is i believe is known for making children's content right if they make children's content but the people that have the littles are more like adults who are in their like maybe 20s and 30s and things like that how much will that translate i'm not really sure right but we also see with like pokemon for example i mean pokemon's different because it's the number one, like one of the number one franchises, but for Pokemon is a children's series, right? But because there's so much nostalgia, like the Pokemon cars from generation one, where when I was a kid growing up, like that's the thing that we like really liked, it has a lot of value, right? And so how the IP play is a little bit, uh, confusing in terms of like if the show is successful will the you know nft become successful it's pretty unclear but because this is the wild wild west who knows right and i have talked to will before and i believe we might potentially be doing an interview on the parallax coming up real soon you know they do have other things coming up in the pipeline so you know just keep an eye out for that now in other news writer rips who's an artist he kind of made this whole claim that you know board ape is like racist and things like that right and he so he partnered up with wilmer hale which i believe is a law firm and this guy lewis who's supposedly an expert in nfts and copyright laws and ip they also have like like poly zero x and you know all these other guys are working together you know for me for this video i'm just gonna take a neutral stance i mean i'm not an intellectual ip expert so i'm not even gonna comment on like what's fair use and what's not fair use i can give my opinion but this is literally just opinion it's gonna be interesting to see how this actually plays out right because will yuga labs just be like hey we're just gonna pay you a bunch of money to like go away and, and not cause this problem or is it that there might be a case here and then it's gonna just completely break down the doors of what you're able to do with other people's ip because it's like so decentralized and whatever right or like art and free speech. So I don't know, but I'm just following along because it's 
kind of entertaining just to see like this uh, drama, although this is not a drama channel. You know, it's just something that's on everybody's radar. Now, moving on, we're going to be talking about Azuki Spirit Dao. Actually, just yesterday, I had a call with somebody who was, you know, part of this uh, Dao over here, and he was kind of explaining to me how it worked and what was the purpose. And actually, I found it quite interesting because there's a lot of learning lessons we have here. Now, I know a lot of people are like, oh, but how can you be talking about Azuki? Zach Vaughn is a scammer and things like that, right? For this video, I'm not trying to say who's a scammer, who's not a scammer. I'm not trying to take any sides. I'm just trying to share with you what I find personally interesting. I actually don't have any uh, Azuki assets or NFTs, so I'm not trying to pump any bags. I'm just sharing with you what I feel is personally interesting and actually makes an impact on the NFT space. So when you go on the Azuki website and you go into the garden, you kind of understand like what their vision is, right? So in the beginning, it was kind of like, oh, this is cool IP. Everybody bought into it because it was cool. But then some of the language that they had was like a decentralized like IP, right? So like you go on their website, they're like, Azuki is a brand, new kind of brand that we can build together, a brand for the metaverse by the community. So when I read that in the very beginning when this came out, I was like, okay, well, how is a brand built by a community? Because technically it's owned by by, you know, one company, right? And when you sell an NFT, it's not like you're selling ownership of your company. You're selling a collectible just as Pokemon, the IP and the franchise will sell you a Pokemon card. You can have a $100,000 Charizard, but it doesn't mean you own a percentage of Pokemon, the franchise, right? So I was like, well, what does that really mean? Over time, as we see these progress, I'm starting to understand what it means, right? When we look at Azuki Dao, they did have some Twitter spaces that I didn't have a chance to listen to. I tried looking for it yesterday and it seems like they were deleted. So not too much information that I could have pulled from there. But based on my conversation, and just kind of looking at it. This is kind of like how it works. So a group of people got together, they pulled some money together and their whole goal is to buy really rare grail azukis, right? So like they go out looking for the rare azukis and they try to negotiate buying these rare azukis and pretty much collecting it together. Now, some people might say like, hmm, that's kind of risky that, you know, you would pull so much money just to buy one type of assets. Most of your portfolio is within azuki, right? I'm sure they buy other stuff, right? I'm not exactly sure about that because I'm not part of the spirit out. But anyways, azuki is their main thing. Let's say if they really believe in azuki and azuki takes off and it becomes the next Pokemon, Hell Kitty or whatever, right? They have all the rare ones. So, you know, suddenly their value of their assets is significantly a lot more than it was when they bought the, these assets, right? But if Azuki goes down, then they go down with it, right? That's the game. The play here, from my understanding, is that Azuki is IP, which uh, Azuki Spirit Dao is kind of separated from the IP. They're like two different organizations, right? So Azuki, the company is doing their thing, trying to push the brand and, and raise awareness. And Azuki Dao is buying all the rare ones and they're riding off the wave of what Azuki is creating. And then because they own all these rare assets, one day, maybe in the future, they can license out their IP to other brands. Let's say Netflix wanted to do a series of about Azuki, right? Well, if they have all the rare ones and the producers of this series wants to license the rare ones from the Spirit DAO, then they would have to pay Spirit DAO money to use these NFTs. And so that's the game. Or if somebody wants to make a comic, a book, a plushie toy, a video game, well, they have all these assets. And also Azuki, the Spirit DAO, they can actually use their money and their funds and things like that to push this even further, right? So if they own the assets to this IP, they don't have to wait on Azuki to, let's say, create a comic, a movie, a manga, anime, whatever, they can actually just do it themselves because they actually own the rights to some capacity to this IP and they can kind of do anything they want from a commercial standpoint. I'm sure there's more like legality to that and specifics to like how that licensing works, but they have the option to do that, right? And so what we're going to see in the future is that it's not just one company pushing forward and trying to push their brand. It's that, yeah, they're going to do what they do, but then you have these other organizations that are going to buy all the rare assets and they have an incentive to also increase the value of the entire community. What if somebody creates the Bean Dow and they just buy a bunch of rare beans, right? And they try to create IP with that. And I can see how it's like a decentralized uh, IP play where different organizations can come together and then buy different assets. And then they all have the same goal of raising the awareness of one brand, right? And so we see this with Spirit Out, which is actually quite interesting. And I think if they are able to pull it off, I feel a lot of other organizations will be formed around different communities and to do the same thing. Let's say somebody created the, you know, I don't know, the Clone X DAO or something where all they did was buy the rarest Clone X and then they did something similar where they use the IP to create art or movies or whatever and they try to raise their awareness of Clone X so that everyone's assets will increase. It's a very interesting play and it's very interesting to see like a group of people who have a lot of money and that probably are quite smart and connected get together to like raise the awareness for a brand and I'm pretty sure this is going to happen for more brands in the future because why not, right? If you already see a tidal wave and you know that's going and it's like this full first 
and you have an opportunity to jump on that and contribute to it, I think a lot of people will jump on that, right? It's the same with like Ethereum is becoming really popular, right? Like let's say in the beginning of when Ethereum started, if people saw that there was this whole wave, then if they build on top of Ethereum or if they create a YouTube channel talking about Ethereum, they're also raising the awareness of Ethereum. And in the end, everybody kind of pushes Ethereum into the mainstream and then now everybody buys Ethereum, right? It's kind of the same concept, but specifically towards like niche cultures and NFTs. It's something I'm really interested in. Taking a step outside of Web3 and, and going into Web2 to see how, you know, this may make an impact to see how the worlds can collide. Just, you know, last week, Logan Paul, and I know a lot of people have mixed feelings about Logan Paul. Some people hate him, some people love him, but you cannot deny that he's a good storyteller. So Logan Paul, you know, obviously he's really big on Pokemon, right? And he did this whole video. It's actually pretty good, really well made, but he did this video about how he purchased the most expensive Pokemon card, which is like $5.6 million, right? And then I was really thinking about this and yes, it's a good story. It gets views, but like I was thinking, why would someone go out their way to like make this whole documentary about buying Pokemon cards. And then I thought about it and I looked at other videos that Logan Paul did. You know, there's one where he opened like the most expensive like Pokemon booster pack. There's another one where he bought a really rare Charizard for like $400,000 or something, right? And so there's these series of videos of him buying the most expensive Pokemon cards. And if you really think about it, the thing I'm talking about, like, you know, Azuki's and Spirit Down and Ethereum and whatever, they also apply to Pokemons, right? They all collectibles at the end of the day. From my speculation, how it works is that if you are a Pokemon collector, and you have a stash of just some of the rarest Pokemon cards. You're basically like the Azuki Dao of Pokemon cards, right? You just buy a bunch of Pokemon cards because you're rich. You're incentivized to put more content out there, tell more stories, and get more people interested in the hobby of collecting Pokemon cards, right? So when somebody buys the most expensive Pokemon card, that kind of raises the bar of like how much Pokemon cards should be worth. So if PSA Illustrator Pikachu, you know, goes for like $5.6 million, then does that increase the value of all the other PSA graded uh, Illustrator Pikachu cards? Possibly, right? Or if let's say he bought the Charizard for like $400,000, whatever, right? So that sets a precedent of like, if I buy this card for $400,000, that's the floor now. And so anytime somebody wants to buy another Charizard, the floor now is $400,000 because Logan Paul bought it, right? It brings so much more awareness other people who have money who maybe didn't know much about Pokemon cards are like, oh, yo, I got a lot of money. I want to flex. I want to buy the most expensive Pokemon card, just like Logan Paul did. Um, so I'm going to pay $400,000. So now they set the new floor. On the show, he's actually coming out the stage with a Pokemon card, the Pokemon card that he just bought. So it's like, why would he wear a Pokemon card, like gold chain or whatever, going to a wrestling match? Because millions of people are going to see it. And then it only takes like one person who's willing to buy this card for like however millions of dollars to like increase the floor. They're actually raising awareness for a specific type of niche, which is Pokemon cards in a mainstream way to attract new people into the hobby, which actually increases demand for these assets. And because they already have so much of these assets from years ago, the assets that they have, they keep pumping up, right? This is how it goes, right? If you ever study like fine art, collectibles and things like that, this is the game that people play. So it's nothing new. People have been doing this in uh, modern art and fine art for like hundreds of years or thousands of years, right? But now that we're seeing it in a new form with this whole social media thing and telling story and making videos, history is kind of rhyming again. And so if you are, let's say an NFT trader or if and if you're an NFT investor, you have to look at these things to understand who is holding large bags of certain assets, who has an incentive to increase the value of these assets, and are there enough people who will collectively come together to increase the value of these assets, increase awareness, tell stories, and turn something into a brand, especially with the rise of NFTs where you're able to own the rights to your specific IP. You even have a more incentive to do it because there's obviously financial gain. And as much as we all love collectibles and things like that, you have to understand that people want to collect, but they also want to make money, right? Um, and so if you understand those macro ways or you understand like who can actually make moves, then you can, you know, take more comfortable positions to be like, I'm gonna buy this thing because I know that these people all have whatever, and I know that they have the potential to drive the demand up when the time comes. So that's something that I'm looking at very deeply. You know, some people might be like, is that manipulating the market? Well, I don't know. If you just tell, make a YouTube video sharing what you love, is that manipulating the market? It's definitely a learning lesson and people do it all the time. So I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that's what it is. And if you can align yourself, you could be in a very comfortable position. For anyone who is interested in the Parallax Genesis NFT, which we launched, you know, a couple weeks ago, the reveal of our NFT is coming up real soon. I wouldn't be surprised if it potentially revealed next week, latest the week after. So if you ever, you know, thought about getting into, uh, you know, the Parallax NFT, maybe you want to get it before the reveal, maybe you want to get it, you know, 
post reveal, you know, whatever it is. I just want to let you know that it is coming real soon. If you want to learn more about the community, just check out our discord link is in the description. Now, the final project that we're going to talk about today is going to be Kiko mints. You know, I don't know too much about this project, but I do know that there's this thing going on, right? Called the Kiko alpha wars. It's kind of like this game where, you know, you get a group of people and you try to like solve puzzles and figure things out. And then in the end, you're going to get rewarded. Um, and so it's similar to how, like when Neo Tokyo came out, they were coming out with riddles and puzzles. And then what naturally happened is that people, you know, organized in the group and different discords. I remember in the cyber Kongs discord, there was like a whole channel just for Neo Tokyo. They would just come together and, and help each other solve these puzzles, right? Kiko mints is kind of like doing something similar in our discord. There's like this whole thread about Kiko alpha wars and people are actually like helping each other figure this out. So there's a lot of excitement into it. If you're interested in that, you can check out our discord to see what's up, or you can just check it out for yourself. And so with that said, that's everything that we got to cover for this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like subscribe, turn on notifications. Let me know in the comments, you know, what was your favorite part about this video? Curious to know what kind of content you want to see more of. With that said, I'll see you guys in the next one.